Well, let me begin by thanking the organizers of MASNA, first of all, for the invitation to be here today and to present this talk about the Hawaii Aquarium Fishery. And also, to, I want to thank them and all the volunteers for the hard work they've done putting this great conference together. Before I start my talk, one caveat. Uh, I want to be clear about this. I'm not an official representative of the Hawaii Aquarium Fishery, and I'm not paid in any way to, to do any work on their behalf. I'm doing this because I have great respect for the aquarium hobby, and I believe very strongly in the data that clearly demonstrate this fishery is sustainable. Last but not least, maybe even first, I want to thank these individuals for their help during the preparation of this talk. Obviously, there are a lot of people involved in this issue, um, a lot more than this list, but these specific uh, people, uh, Pete Basabi, Tony Nahaki, Dr. William Walsh, Jim Lynch, uh, Marja Wai, John Coppolino, Bob and Tammy DeWitt, uh, Bill Dorman at Hawaii Public Radio, Les Matsura, and Dr. William Walsh again, uh, helped with comments, discussion, and some of the audiovisual uh, materials. So now let me begin. I want to begin by asking you in the audience a couple of questions. How many of you uh, maintain a marine aquarium? Okay, a substantial number of people in the audience have an aquarium. Well, no surprise, it's a marine aquarium conference, but there are a few people in here who don't at any rate. The second question, how many of you have a yellow tang in your aquarium? almost the same number, or maybe slightly less, but a significant number. So it's not surprising nearly all of you have some connection already with the Hawaii Aquarium Fishery because that yellow tang, 99% chance came from Hawaii. But as all, probably everybody in this room knows this Hawaii Aquarium Fishery has now been shut down. <clears throat> How did that happen? Well, back in October 2012, Renee Umberger, a name to keep in mind, and others, including the Conservation Council of Hawaii, the Hawaii Humane Society, I'm sorry, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Center for Biological Diversity and others, sued the State of Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. They filed a complaint for declaratory judgment and injunctive relief to compel defendant, DLNR, to comply with the environmental review procedures mandated by the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act, known as HEPA. The lower courts uh, rejected this complaint, but ultimately it was taken to the Hawaii Supreme Court where it was upheld. On September 7th, 2017, one year ago, the DLNR issued a statement that it had discontinued issuance of new aquarium fish permits and renewal of existing aquarium fish permits. A few days later, the Honolulu Star, uh, Honolulu Star Advertiser devoted significant editorial space to present both sides of the arguments. Rene Umberger and Summer Kupau Odo, another name you'll hear again, argued that fish abundance on Hawaii reefs is declining, which is true for food fishes, but not for aquarium species. Although they might define the term uh, decline differently than we would, they also argued that allowing vast numbers of marine animals to be exported and sold for private profit without any scientific assurance of sustainability should never have been allowed. Now, once again, they may have a different definition of sustainable in the way it's defined by conservation biologists. I was given the opportunity to argue on behalf of the fishery and pointed out that the Hawaii Aquarium fishery is sustainable and that there's significant <coughs> um, data to back that up. And also, and particularly because of the huge reproductive potential of yellow tangs and other reef species to quickly replace fish that are collected. We sometimes look at it as like a bank account. The capital, the brood stock, is not touched. The interest that accumulates are the fish that are collected for you for the aquarium trade, and that interest continues to accrue. Well, that brings me to the title of the talk, Hawaii's Aquarium Fishery. What happened? And I'll try in the limited time I have now to give you an overview of the situation as it unfolded, where it stands now, and a bit of where we go from here. <clears throat> and let me first start out by showing you how Hawaii fish are collected. All Hawaii fish are net collected. No chemicals are used, just skill. Fish are collected without damaging the coral. A simple barrier net is set up and the fish are herded into the net. It looks simple, 
but it requires patience and skill. The diver is selective. She is keeping only fish of the correct size and releasing fish that are undesirable or not permitted. The fish must be decompressed to minimize expansion of the fish's swim bladder when they are brought to the surface. Excess pressure remaining in the swim bladder is released by a quick and simple procedure using a hypodermic needle. This is no more harmful to the fish than giving any pet an immunization shot. Care is taken to separate some fish that might fight by placing them in individual containers. Clearly this work is labor intensive, requiring skill, hard work, and a great deal of expensive gear. Okay, so you have an idea, at least, that is how aquarium fish have been collected. Um, the needling part I put in there, I know sometimes that causes some concern, but in my opinion, as I said, it's really, we give ourselves shots, pet shots, it's really not any different than that. A brief history of the aquarium fishery controversy. Uh, so here are some comments from a workshop sponsored by Sea Grant at the University of Hawaii on this issue, and I'm going to read some of the comments made at this workshop. Dr. John Randall, the preeminent ichthyologist of our time, said, There are some who feel the aquarium fish collecting in Hawaii should be banned. I do not agree with this view. The populations of these fishes are enormous, and the catch of the collectors is insignificant if we consider the populations as a whole. The answer for both sides, those who want to stop commercial fish collecting and those who wish to continue it, is the development of more marine preserves. And Dr. Leighton Taylor, who was the director of the Waikiki Aquarium before I was, made these comments based on initial surveys that he conducted. The results of our study for five species in the Kona area showed that little impact was being made on Hawaii reefs as a result of aquarium fish collecting. One way to solve the conflict would be to exclude areas from any harvesting. And finally, Dr. Bill Walsh, who's been the leader of reef fish monitoring surveys on the West Hawaii coast, said, Public awareness over the possible harmful effects of aquarium fish collecting is increasing. Emotion over this issue is intense, and the anti-collectors are strongly critical of the reef rapers. Dr. Taylor's study must be regarded as only an initial step in answering some of the questions. It is necessary, indeed imperative, that further studies be conducted. Okay, that was back in 1978. Forty years ago, this uh, issue has been uh, controversial, but it was recognized at that time that more protected areas and research should be needed. So we've gone back 40 years. I'm going to skip through the next 20 years and note there were attempts nearly every year at the Hawaii State Legislature to shut down the aquarium fishery. All of those attempts failed. The legislature in those years was apparently not interested in putting people in the aquarium fishery out of work and had confidence in their Department of Land and Natural Resources that it was performing its duties to protect the resource and the environment. Finally, in 1998, landmark legislation was passed to bring groups together to establish a management plan for the aquarium fishery along the entire West Hawaii coast. I'm going to review this in some detail, so pay attention because later you'll be hearing that none of this ever happened. You're going to hear that DLNR has no management plan, has not conducted research, and has not involved the public. You're going to hear that in an audio clip in a few minutes. But here's the truth of the matter. First, let me familiarize you with the five main Hawaiian islands in the Hawaiian archipelago, Kauai, Oahu, Molokai, Maui, and the Hawaii Island, also known as the Big Island, where the volcano has been rather active. It's, I think it's shut off at the moment. The Hawaii Aquarium Fishery is centered on only two islands, Oahu and Hawaii Island, and 78% of the uh, aquarium fishes come from Hawaii Island, so I'm going to focus most attention on Hawaii Island Fishery. Act 306 of 1998 led to the creation of the West Hawaii Regional Fishery Management Area. It extends 147 coastal miles from Upolu Point in the north to Kale at South Point. Act 306 required that more than 30% of those 
147 coastal miles uh, be set aside as fish replenishment areas. They're known as FRAs, fish replenishment areas. These FRAs are a critical part of this plan, so keep FRA in mind. And also understand that FRAs are only closed to aquarium fishermen. You can still enter FRAs to catch food, fish for food, uh, but fortunately fish like the yellow tang uh, is not a food fish. Unfortunately, Achilles tangs and cole are food fish. Uh, other areas that are completely closed to all fishing are designated as Marine Life Conservation Districts, or MLCDs, many of which existed prior to 306. And the open areas are where aquarium fish collecting is allowed. This act also required evaluation of the effectiveness of the management plan in cooperation with the University of Hawaii and the act required substantial involvement of the community in management decisions. The West Hawaii Fishery Council convened June 16, 1998 under the aegis of DLNR and Sea Grant with 24 voting members and six ex officio agency representatives from DLNR, Sea Grant, and the governor's office, and four aquarium representatives were members. Almost a year later, after intensive work, on April 28, 1999, the public was invited to hear this fish replenishment area plan, which consists of nine separate areas comprising 35.2% of the West Hawaii coastline, and it included the MLCDs, the Conservation District. So this sets aside 35% of the coastline where no aquarium fishing is allowed. This photo represents only half of the people in the room that night. There were 860 people in the room. It was one of the largest public hearings on a natural resource issue in the state of Hawaii. And 93.5% of 876 responses that night were in favor of this FRA plan. Following this public approval, the FRA plan was incorporated by the Department of Land and Natural Resources into an administrative rule it was signed by Governor Cayetano on the 17th of December, 1999, the end of that year. And that's really 1999 was everything begins. The creation of the West Hawaii Fish, Fish Council and the Fish Replenishment Areas Plan has been the focus of a number of in-depth reports and scientific case studies, making it one of the most intensively studied community drive management efforts in the state of Hawaii. The creation of the WHFC is entirely attributable to the volunteer commitment of its members. These community members have contributed thousands of hours of time at no cost to the state. And these efforts have been assisted by the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Nature Conservancy, the Community Conservation Network, the Malama Kai Foundation, the Harold Castle Foundation, and all of the individuals listed in this slide who have participated in thousands of underwater surveys since 1999. The West Hawaii Regional Fishery Management Area is monitored at study sites along the West Hawaii coast. And surveys began in 1999, right after the approval. There are nine fish replenishment areas, the FRAs, where no aquarium fishing is allowed. And there's eight open areas where fish uh, collecting is allowed. <coughs> And there's six marine life conservation districts, which are control sites for the scientific study, where no fishing of any kind is allowed. 23 permanent transect sites were established, covering all of the FRAs, the MLCDs, and the open areas. Each of these transects, a belt transect, is 25 meters in length by 4 meters wide, and divers will go over and uh, count the densities of all fish and some invertebrates, which are visually estimated along each transect. These transect surveys are conducted four times a year, and as of last month, I got an update. 8,512 transect studies have been completed, representing the cumulative efforts of 77 survey divers. The, a requirement of Act 306 from 1998 was the preparation of a report to the legislature every five years detailing the results of the management plan and surveys. This is the most recent report presented to the legislature in January 2015. Dr. Bill Walsh, who heads the Division of Aquatic Resources in West Hawaii, has spearheaded the management of efforts uh, and these underwater surveys. I'm going to let him speak for himself, and actually he should be here because uh, he's done yeoman's effort on this to, to get this work done. I'll let him speak through this video. By examining the patterns of abundance and uh, through time, we get a really good feel for the overall you know, sustainability of the fishery. But uh, 
that said, we also are looking at and monitoring, you know, the other species which can be collected. And uh, one of the recent initiatives was to limit in West Hawaii which species could be collected. We uh, developed with the West Hawaii Fishery Council what's termed a white list uh, of 40 species. Uh, and these are species that are, tend to be more abundant. They're not the rare, uncommon, uh, highly valued species. So uh, we can look at what's going on with those. But, you know, going back to yellow tang, you can see this is a result uh, this is a kind of a uh, mock-up of the data of since 1999 in the three different kinds of areas, the MPAs, which were long protected, the FRAs, which became protected back around the beginning of 2000, and then the open areas. And you can see that all of the areas have increased, you know, looking at the most recent couple of years to, to the previous years back in time here, uh, the FRAs, the population of yellow tang, have gone up by 72%. And even the, yellow, even the uh, yellow tang populations in the open areas, which is the ones that are being collected, have increased by 31%. So uh, it's very significant that all the areas that are increasing, not just the areas that are closed. And when we created this whole uh, network of protected areas, we envisioned it as, a, as serving as a model for what happens if you institute a fully protected no-take area. And even if the uh, second most collected species, uh, and this is the figure showing that's very, uh, even more dramatic increases, 56% in the, in the marine protected areas, 47% in the FRAs, and a 54% increase in the open areas. And the population of both these species have increased by millions of fish over that period of time. Unique things about the aquarium fishery is it is the most intensively managed uh, fishery uh, in, in Hawaii. It's also the economically most valuable inshore fishery. It exceeds uh, reef fishes in general. It exceeds even bottom fish in, in, in the economic return of it. So, you know, having a well-managed fishery makes sense both ecologically and economically for the state of Hawaii. Uh, and the, the key difference, basically, is, is the percentage of areas which are off limits to the aquarium collectors, which constitutes 35 percent. 65 percent is open. The aquarium fishery targets small individuals, immature individuals. And if you can have areas that allow those uh, small individuals to mature, and they, for yellow tang, that's you know, somewhere around five to seven years, and then they start reproducing. And for yellow tang, they have a relatively long lifespan of 40 years or so. So for decades after decade, uh, in those areas that are protected, there's successful reproduction, and as they get bigger, the reproduction actually increases. And then, uh, almost fortuitously, unlike a lot of other fisheries which target the biggest fish, the, the ones that reproduce most, the aquarium fishery doesn't. And there's almost like a size refuge, even in the open areas, where once they reach a certain size, and that's typically around that size at maturity, they're not really desired for aquarium collecting, and, and, and they're released if they're caught. So. Uh, even in the open areas, there's very robust populations of the adults. Uh, and the third thing with the, with the aquarium fishery, particularly the yellow tang, it's not a desired food fish. So uh, we have three things going for it, and that's unique, literally, in most fisheries to have all three uh, sort of behavioral, biological, and uh, management options making things work. Okay, in summary. The controversy over aquarium fishing uh, in Hawaii has gone on for 40 years. There have been numerous attempts to ban aquarium fishing through legislative action, and they've been defeated over many years. Act 306 finally brought together key representatives to develop a robust management plan for West Hawaii aquarium fishery with substantial community input and support. And data from 8,512 DLNR surveys from 1999 through 2018 have conclusively demonstrated the West Hawaii aquarium fishery is sustainable. Conclusion. Hawaii has a well-managed, intensively studied, sustainable aquarium fishery lauded as one of the best managed coral reef fisheries in the world. And I should be able to say, the end, <laughs> but not. Uh, here's the rest of the story. Enter Renee Umberger and Robert Wintner, AKA Snorkel Bob, and their organization for the fishes. I may say there may be a representative of this organization here today, so listen up. Their mission is through consumer education, scientific research, 
I have yet to see that, but scientific research and advocacy, we work to re uh, reduce the demand for coral reef fish and other tropical wildlife that have been captured unsustainably from the wild for display in saltwater aquariums. And the capture of fish and other wildlife for display in personal aquariums is one of the biggest threats to coral reefs in tropical Pacific waters. Never mind global warming and the rest of that. Umberger and Wintner have saturated, saturated the media and public meetings with their own alternative facts and inflammatory rhetoric, such as calling the aquarium fish trade wildlife trafficking. Trafficking is the trade in endangered and threatened species uh, that are, are protected. Uh, none of our fish are endangered or threatened and it's all perfectly legal, but nonetheless, it's inflammatory language, but it works, calling it wildlife trafficking. They claim there's been a 70 to 90% decline in yellow tanks, despite what you saw. Uh, they also claim that fish collecting has caused coral reef degradation. There are studies to the contrary. And that some reef fish assemblages have collapsed and endemic species are disappearing. I know of no data to that effect. These may, uh, <clears throat> they make these statements without any foundation from scientifically gathered data. In fact, the published data that do exist completely contradict these claims. And their comments are specifically designed to elicit a strong negative and emotional response from their audience towards aquarium fish collectors. But the fishery has made some monumental blunders. You've seen this picture already. And this has not helped their cause at all, such as this most unfortunate photo of dead yellow tangs. Uh, I don't know the circumstances behind this photo. I don't know who dumped them, how they did die. Did they all die at once? Were they frozen over a long period of time and dumped? I don't know. It doesn't matter. This photo's horrible. But it's the only photo I know of. I mean, there's different angles, but it's still the only photo. Uh, it's an isolated incident. It's not a regular occurrence in the aquarium fishery. Meanwhile, there's no outcry from anyone about photos like this, which are a daily occurrence at Honolulu fish markets and completely legal. A cooler full of dead Achilles tangs for food is apparently acceptable. A live one for an aquarium is not. It makes you wonder, are they really interested in protecting the species or just shutting down the aquarium fishery? And then there's this blunder that ended up on natural, uh, national news. I'll have to play it, you need, yeah, need to see it. The uh, fish collector in this video was being recorded by Renee Umberger. He swam over to her and pulled a regulator out of her mouth. <coughs> okay, I have to give credit to Renee Umberger for presence of mind to keep the video running, but nonetheless, this is dumb. Dumb. And now, in a new film apparently to be released next year that all of you need to be uh, cognizant of is The Dark Hobby. Now, this goes beyond just the Hawaii Aquarium Fishery. This is you. Robert Wintner narrates this, Snorkel Bob, and he makes the claim that you hobbyists end up killing most of your fishes every year, and this is what keeps the aquarium fishery in business. Snorkel Bob and his supporters know that people will watch this video and will believe every word of it because there's no effective countermedia campaign geared for the general public telling the true story, that in fact, all of you really do care for your fish in aquariums and do an excellent job keeping your fish alive and healthy. Let me play the trailer to The Dark Hobby. This is a Hawaii treasure. This is Hawaii culture. This is who we are and they're stealing it. It's like cut flowers, but this is marine wildlife. Now, you need two things to be an aquarium collector in Hawaii. It's a pulse and 50 bucks. It's, it's a gold rush here. They're coming from all over the place to take our fish. At any given moment, there are 27 million reef wildlife individuals in the aquarium pipeline. The pipeline begins at the point of capture and it ends when the fish goes belly up in a home aquarium. The mortality rates are about 99% within a year of the point of capture. And that means that all those fish demand replacement and the demand comes from the home hobbies. That's how the system works.
Yeah, discus. <laughs> Who knew? Well, has this negative campaign worked? Oh, yes, indeed, it has worked. The misinformation and inflammatory rhetoric, coupled with a few disturbing photos and incidents, have been enough to change public opinion in Hawaii. And as you can see in this informal poll taken by the Honolulu Star Advertiser, 56% uh, of the uh, respondents uh, 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 believe that reef fish collecting should be banned. And 34% want it stopped pending an environmental impact statement. A caveat that this is not a scientific poll, it's just the newspaper asking, but it's the opinions of 1,147 readers, but I wouldn't discount it. <clears throat> All of these efforts to stop the aquarium fishery ended up in the legislature again and culminated in another piece of legislation in 2017, introduced to Senate Bill 1240. This bill would have ultimately ended the fishery by allowing all existing aquarium fish permits to terminate on their expiration dates. Twelve scientists from Hawaii and other states uh, wrote to the legislators urging them to vote against Senate Bill 1240. The consensus of scientific opinion is that the aquarium fishery has demonstrated through rigorous scientific methodology that it is sustainable and has caused no environmental harm. Plus, it has significant economic benefits to individuals in the state of Hawaii. Nevertheless, the bill this time was passed. Subsequently, the head of the Department of Land and Natural Resources, Suzanne Case, urged Hawaii Governor David Ige to veto the bill based on the department's extensive research and data. Representatives from the industry, including myself, and from PJAC, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, also met with the governor urging him to veto the bill. At the same time, the governor was under intense pressure to sign the bill into law. Ultimately, Governor David Ige decided to veto the bill, so there was a reprieve for the aquarium fishery for a few months. Then, in September 2017, the Hawaii Supreme Court issued its decision that DLNR does have to abide by the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act and conduct studies to demonstrate whether or not the aquarium fishery is having any significant environmental, uh, negative environmental effects. What was not understood by everyone, however, and this is a critical detail, aquarium fishery permits are not issued to allow collection of aquarium fishes, but rather they allow fishermen to use fine mesh nets less than two inches uh, mesh size. Otherwise, state law, which supersedes agency rules, allows any commercial fisherman to use a net with a mesh size two inches or greater. Until state law is overturned, any commercial fisherman has a right by law to use larger mesh size nets. Unfortunately for the West Hawaii fishery, aquarium fishermen there also need a West Hawaii Island Aquarium Permit, which is, includes a sticker added to their commercial marine license card. Those permits and stickers are no longer being issued, so that aquarium fishery in West Hawaii is closed. Mind you, you can still catch and kill Achilles tang and cole and other species, but you cannot capture them alive for your aquariums. You can kill them. You have them on your boat alive. Somebody's coming to check you. Kill it. Oahu and East Hawaii waters are still technically open, but they do and they don't require the sticker, but those areas are far less productive. After their victory, Earth Justice Attorney Summer Kupau Odo was uh, invited to speak on Hawaii Public Radio, and a few days later, Bruce Anderson from the Department of Land and Natural Resources was invited to give his counter arguments. Here's an ed edited version of those interviews. Aquarium fishing for commercial purposes has been halted in Hawaii by court order. It's a temporary halt, but it means all existing permits are null and void, pending an environmental review. The court order is the latest step in a long process for Earth Justice, and Senior Associate Attorney Summer Kupau Odo is with us to explain what it all means. With a click, few clicks of their mouse and the payment of a $50 fee, they could obtain automatically a permit that would allow them to take unlimited numbers of our reef fish and wildlife for exportation and sale um, in Hawaii and throughout the world. Um, so our clients were very concerned about this process and the Supreme Court in September, the Hawaii Supreme Court, declared this process invalid. It's illegal. Uh, DLNR's practice of rubber stamping these permits blindly without um, studying environmental impacts violated our cornerstone environmental law, the Hawaii Environmental Policy Act. And uh, the law, which we refer to as HEPA, establishes a very specific environmental review process, uh, all geared towards the goal of having our government decision makers um, be informed of 
all environmental impacts before they make decisions, before they authorize private activities, and in this case, the mining of our public resources for private profit. DLNR's um, history, its refusal to engage in the environmental review process for decades now, um, HIPAA has been on the books. Again, it's our cornerstone environmental law, and this agency, which is under a constitutional and statutory duty to conserve our resources, to manage them properly. It had a duty to comply with this law, but it refused to do so. And given that history, you know, my clients, I I think it's hard to have any faith that they're going to do something. If I talk to somebody from DLNR, I'm betting they wouldn't describe it as a refusal. What would they describe it as? (laughs) What would their uh, explanation be? You know, I think their explanation, um, interestingly, has not been a lack of resources. I haven't heard that. Um, Their explanation has been that, you know, out of thin air, that it's sustainable, that we don't have to manage uh, this fishery because it's sustainable. But conclusory unilateral statements such as that by an agency is precisely what HEPA forbids. They have not... um, prepared a document or done a study that is anywhere near comparable to the that required under the Environmental Policy Act. You know, a process um, that co- of collaboration, public participation, um, transparency, right? Um, its own reports, and looking back to 1998, the State of the Reefs report, there DLNR concluded that studies are necessary at that time if the aquarium collection is to continue. And more recently, in a report in 2015 to the legislature, it found that fish are significantly depleted in areas the trade operates. Um, A number of species have failed to respond to the no-take areas established to protect them, and they've actually decreased since 1999. So, you know, we're, we're very concerned. We believe, even though those numbers show, you know, hundreds of thousands of fish being collected each year, we believe it could be much greater, and we could be talking in the millions of fish stripped from our reefs every year now for for decades. The discussion generated as many questions as it did answers, so our producer, Ryan Finnerty, called the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Aquatic Resources Administrator, Dr. Bruce Anderson, to get the facts on the aquarium industry in Hawaii. So, Bruce, I'm looking at uh, a report that the Department of Land and Natural Resources submitted to the legislature, state legislature, in 2015, uh, and it shows an increase of 22% uh, over the past 40 years in total catch. Earth Justice seems to be making the claim that uh, we're not taking into consideration the pop- overall populations of these fish. Is that an accurate statement, or is the department actively managing these, uh, the populations of these species being taken? No, that's not an accurate statement, and I think uh, they should know a lot better than that if they've ever looked at the data. We've we've collected data for over 17 years uh, from over 6,700 surveys um, and and found that aquarium fish populations are generally stable or increasing in West Hawaii, where, again, most of the aquarium fish are collected. The populations of yellow tang and coli, which are the two most heavily collected species, are not declining. In recent years, they've both been increasing, both in the protected areas and in open areas. What's, I think, being confused here perhaps even intentionally, is that is that the resource fish, the fish that, that people are eating, are declining. But the aquarium fish, the fish that are uh, the subject of this case, are really, the data we have, and we have very good data on this, as I said, it was as good as anywhere in the world, shows that the fish populations are stable or increasing. So you would say that, uh, specifically with aquarium fish, the population and current practices are what could be considered sustainable? No question. If you define sustainability as the numbers remaining the same and and or increasing, then then they're sustainable. Okay, that gives you people who are actually in this whole big mix. You've heard from both of them now. Where are we uh, at this moment? Well, here's the current situation, at least as of last month, not as of this moment, but Uh, The Honolulu Star Advertiser devoted its front page uh, to this report that aquarium fish collecting is greatly reduced, no surprise, because it's mostly uh, shut down, uh, and mostly because the West Hawaii fishery is closed. Some collecting is occurring on East Hawaii and Oahu using larger mesh nets. 
Opponents are saying the governor and DLNR are ignoring the supposed ban on collecting, and so the dispute continues right to this moment. And meanwhile, with considerable effort by PJAC, two environmental assessments were filed last spring, one for the Oahu fishery and one for the Hawaii Island fishery. Both assessments used DLNR data plus additional data from NOAA, and they concluded the fishery was not causing environmental harm and the populations of fishes were not being negatively impacted. Just last month, DLNR issue, uh, rejected these environmental, uh, environmental assessments and called for a much more comprehensive environmental impact statement to be prepared. What happens next? The short answer is, I don't know. I was hoping by the time of this conference I could give you a more definitive answer, but I cannot. Uh, several options are under current dis uh, consideration, including a full environmental impact statement, but final decisions have not been made. Um, and so you will just have to stay tuned. I want to conclude with a couple of uh, slides here, and I know I'm running close to my time limit, but uh, <clears throat> so here's some, some concluding remarks about fish collecting and your aquariums that every aquarist needs to understand about this whole issue. Um, the assault on the Hawaii aquarium fishery is part of a much larger effort to stop the collection and import of all wild-caught marine life. Hobbyists, you, and the industry need to be involved in multimedia and social media efforts to promote the benefits of your aquariums, their educational, scientific, therapeutic, and even economic benefits to a much wider audience outside the hobby, including policymakers and government at all levels. <clears throat> who is doing that now? Who's coordinating it and who is paying for it? Right now, we mostly just talk to each other. And the uh, hobbyists, the aquarium industry, and public aquariums all need to support well-managed, sustainable fisheries like that in Hawaii and do more to ensure that aquarium fisheries in other countries are equally well-managed and sustainable. Make no mistake, if well-funded national organizations can work with local activists in Hawaii to shut down one of the best-managed inshore reef fisheries in the world, that's acknowledged by scientists and fishery biologists that the West Hawaii Aquarium fishery is one of the best managed inshore coral reef fisheries of any kind of fishery in the world. And they do this by shaping public opinion based on a relentless campaign of misinformation, then they can do this for other fisheries as well that are not as well managed. A result of this action will certainly spur greater efforts to aquaculture fishes, and I'm all in favor of doing more to breed aquarium fishes and culture corals. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that buying reef fishes from collectors is one of the only sources of income for many people in areas where jobs are hard to come by. And that includes Hawaii. Those Hawaii fish collectors that you saw earlier in this video are now out of work. And tragically, they're divers. Many of them will have to switch to catching food fish for a living. And those food fish populations we know are already in trouble. This hobby generates significant satisfaction and joy from the accomplishment of keeping a living coral reef in your home. But you have an obligation to ensure there is more value having that fish in your aquarium than leaving it on the reef. We heard about value of, uh, the, the yesterday. How do you help? If you have wild caught fish, give back to nature by supporting reef conservation efforts, support research to monitor coral reef fisheries, and demand to know that the fishes you buy are net collected and the fisheries where they were caught are sustainable and have good long-term data. Share the results of your efforts and make your aquariums as educational as possible for others who view them. Use your aquariums to inspire young people to become marine biologists and start telling your stories to a much wider audience about the value of your aquariums. So thank you very much for your concern and attention. I hope in the not too distant future this issue will be resolved and this well-managed fishery can resume. Thank you.